No, I can't in good conscience play with the system in this condition. Let's fix this disk drive. This is my PlayStation 2, a so-so example of the 30,000 model. It had wax drippings all over it when I first got it. I didn't want to ask those questions either. Because I have the network adapter installed, we'll start by removing that. The screws on the back have a slight concave shape in their heads, allowing you to fasten and loosen them using a large coin. Mine are already pretty scratched up, but this is a good way to avoid damaging their finish when you do this yourself. Of course, you can also use a slotted screwdriver as well. Once those screws are loosened, gently pull the adapter away from the console. Be especially careful if you have anything connected to the IDE interface. We can start to open the console now by turning it over and removing the four rubber feet and four plastic screw covers from the bottom of the case. This is most easily done with a plastic pry tool like the types I have here. Avoid using metal tools to prevent scratching the case. The feet should come out easily. Don't use a lot of force. Be even more careful with the plastic screw covers. Applying too much pressure to the inside of the cover will break the teeth that hold them to the console. Now we can remove the eight screws holding the case together. I used a number two Phillips head for this step. I recommend making a diagram to keep track of where these screws go, as they're not identical, and you'll save yourself time during reassembly if you don't have to remember which ones go where. I'm selling this fine example over on my Etsy page if you're interested. With those screws removed, we can turn the console over and remove the top of the case. Take your time here and use caution not to pull, twist, or otherwise damage this fragile ribbon cable connecting the power and eject buttons to the motherboard. Before we can take the system's boards and the disk drive out, there are several components we need to remove. Behind the heatsink here is a screw that holds the exhaust fan in place. The head is a similar size to the screws we just removed, but I found the collar on my screwdriver here was too thick to reach. I used a thinner screwdriver with a smaller Phillips head. I used the larger screwdriver to remove the controller and memory card interface. Once those are removed, carefully lift the interface assembly and note the ribbon cable that attaches it to the motherboard. Removing this screw near the power socket should free the rear panel from the rest of the case. The cables from the socket pass through the motherboard here to the power supply, so we can't disconnect it entirely yet. There's a flat latch securing the ribbon cable to the controller interface assembly. It needs to be lifted in order to release the cable. Mine was a little stiff, and this is a small, delicate plastic part, so I gently coaxed it open with a pry tool. With those parts out of the way, we can carefully take the system boards and the parts still attached to them and flip them over. This system fan was pretty dirty, so I used an electronics cleaning brush to dust it off. When cleaning cooling fans, I recommend holding the blades still with one hand. That will prevent putting additional stress on the fan shaft and bearings. Look at that cool little spin move. This board to the right of the hard drive bay is the power supply. It's held to the frame by four screws. I used the same number two Phillips head as in previous steps to remove them. Once the board is free, Lift it directly up from the assembly, because a socket on the underside of the power supply connects it to the motherboard. 
you can see the four pins on the motherboard seated in that beige connector, under the fan. In order to remove this RF shield, we'll need to get access to several screws underneath this sheet of insulating plastic. I had to bend mine a little here to get it out, but not enough to damage it. The socket which connects the fan to the motherboard is very small. While you can probably disconnect it by hand, I opted to use some precision tweezers to make sure I didn't pull on the thin cables. Now we have nine screws to remove. The four screws on the right are responsible for securing the heart and soul of the PS2, the emotion engine and graphics synthesizer, to the heatsink on the other side. Those are the CPU and GPU, respectively, in Sony speak. I guess I shouldn't be surprised this is the company who went on to fork FreeBSD for their console OS, only to defile it with proprietary graphics APIs. Anyway, we can't remove this shield just yet. It's clipped to the frame of the DVD drive. Once again, I use my trusty pry tool to lift the metal clear of the tabs on the disk drive. Once those clips are released, you should also be able to remove that metal shield from the motherboard. We're almost ready to separate the drive from the console itself, but first, we need to gently tug these ribbon cables out of their sockets. Don't rush this step, because that last cable at the top there uses another latching connector, and the gold cable to its left doesn't have a nice pull tab to make removing it easier. There's our disk drive, ready for a more thorough inspection and cleaning. Let's finish this teardown first though, so we can take care of that clock battery that he's replacing. Remember what I said about small latching connectors? It looks like someone has already learned that lesson the hard way on this board. As much as I want to clean this up, I also want to avoid rendering my system inoperable, so I'm going to leave it for now. I've been meaning to get some captain tape for things like this anyway. Turning the board over, we can see the beefy heatsink fins. The only thing holding them on now is the gentle adhesion of the large thermal pad to the CPU and GPU underneath. As usual, be careful about separating the heatsink from the board to prevent damaging any of the sensitive components underneath. There's our naked PS2 board. It's beautiful, and thankfully won't get this video age restricted. Oh, and there's our dead clock battery. It looks like it wasn't held in properly, but I'm sure it's old enough at this point to be dead, even if it wasn't making proper contact. Looks like I can reinstall it just fine, so that's good. Our battery holder isn't broken. This is the thermal pad. It makes sure that the chips that need to be cooled by the heatsink make thorough contact with the cold plate underneath the pad. Installing the new clock battery is easy. Just line it up with the contacts along the side of the battery holder and gently push the battery against them until it fits into the slot. Those same contacts will hold the battery under the plastic tabs on the other side. That's the easy part done. Let's come back to the disk drive. There are four tiny Phillips head screws holding the top of the drive to the rest of the assembly. I found the top needed some coaxing to take off once the screws were removed. A little wiggling should set it free. I'll let you make your own joke for that one. This small part showing through the disc tray is the laser. Definitely don't touch it, because it's a pain to clean thoroughly. Be careful not to spill anything on it while servicing the drive as well. You'll see what I mean soon enough. Let's turn the drive back over and check out the tray's eject action. Start by pushing this white plastic part to the side to lower the laser carriage and allow the disc tray to eject. Now it should be possible to slowly and carefully pull the drive tray out. Mine was so gunked up here that it's difficult to pull out, even by hand. You can see whatever was used to lubricate this drive was probably too heavy. It's still very shiny and sticky to the touch. I'm fairly confident that's our culprit. Oh, by the way, I apologize for all the small close-ups. 
I shot this process with two phones, with one intended for an isometric angle and close details, but the bitrate overloaded something in my B camera, and my so-called professional camera app didn't warn me about this while it was recording. I'm calling you out, Filmic Pro. You and your bait-and-switch monetization scheme. We'll start by cleaning this gunk up with some rubbing alcohol and a cotton swab. If you're doing this yourself, don't settle for anything less than a 90% alcohol concentration. It's much better at cleaning and shouldn't cost a considerable amount more than diluted products. There was some very stubborn gunk near the front of the drive tray that I couldn't remove by hand. I'm not sure if that's a remnant of the last lubricant that was used on this drive. This doesn't look bad for a 22-year-old piece of hardware. Just a little dust buildup in all the places you'd expect it. 22 years already? Nothing like opening up a box of memories and getting slapped with a memento mori. I chose this multi-surface silicone lubricant to apply to the critical components of this drive. When it comes to lubricants on small parts like this, less is more. Rather than spray directly on this drive, I'm using a cotton swab here to apply it. Don't spray it near the drive like I did here. I was expecting some awesome footage from my other camera, and you already know how that went. I chose silicone because it's an electrical insulator, and I was able to find a product that was labeled as safe for plastic. Whatever you do, always make sure the product you're using is as well. If the package doesn't say so, assume that it isn't. It's a little like buying genuine GBA games on eBay. White lithium grease is another popular option, and I haven't seen a definitive case for one lubricant over the other. This gives me a good opportunity to show you how to clean up any additional lubricant you may have applied in error. Just add some rummage alcohol to a soft cloth and wipe it away gently. After lubricating the parts, I exercise the drive tray a few times to work it in. It already feels much smoother than before, and it doesn't get stuck all the way open or closed like it used to. Before you put the top back on the drive, make sure that the tray is able to close fully and the laser carriage is returned to its horizontal position. It's easy to jump a few teeth on the drive tray and get those parts out of sync, preventing them from operating properly once the console is back together. Okay, let's get this reassembled. I'm going to speed this up a bit for the sake of time, but I want to point out a few important bits about the order of operations here, because this footage is actually compiled from several different attempts to reassemble this system. First, when reattaching the disk drive to the motherboard, reconnect all the ribbon cables before screwing the bottom metal shield back on. You'll want to reconnect the cable for the power and eject buttons at the front of the console now as well. Once the shield is on, reassemble the rear panel, slot the fan in, and don't forget to reconnect it to the board before continuing. Be a good egg and heed that warning sticker. Slot the plastic insulator back in, then carefully align the connector on the power supply board with the pins on the motherboard before seating it fully and securing it to the shield.
Now, I made a mistake here and should have secured the controller and memory card interface to the top of the console's case before reconnecting the ribbon cable. I didn't realize that until there were two screws left over and I'd already taken my set down, and we really needed our kitchen table back. Hey, I'm not perfect, and you don't get footage this clean in an apartment without making a few sacrifices. Speaking of your trusty screw diagram, you'll already know which screws go where to secure the two halves of the case back together. And that's a complete PS2 once again. Let's go test it out. It works! That's much better. It's almost as good as new. Thanks for checking out my video. If you enjoyed it, I'd appreciate a like, or even sharing it with someone you think will enjoy it. I'm Alex from Restore Revise, and I'll see you next time.